I want to ask you two questions. Um, every revolution comes with an utopia and a dystopia. And I've been working in communications for 26, 27 years now, and I have seen many revolutions. Um, many of the results of these uh, revolutions uh, we consider more or less normal and we are used to them. Um, but I think um, at the moment we are witnessing a very big revolution, a very important revolution, and it's basically driven by artificial intelligence. And uh, if you f um, focus on the of on the size and the impact of this revolution, you realize that we have to be careful. We have to be careful that the, whatever is happening technically is based on values we agree on. <coughs> and uh, before we look into the future, I would love to take a look into the past because I think we can learn a lot from what we've gone through the um, last 20 years. And if you look back, you know, in 19, 19, 1994, um, I read this article about Mosaic and I was absolutely thrilled by these things that were happening and I was absolutely convinced that it will change the world and it changed the world. At that time, we all, more or less, all pioneers at that time were very optimistic. We all believed that um, free access to free information will free the mind of the people and f lead to free um, societies. But at the end, we have to realize parts of it happened and parts of it didn't happen. So if we look at the past, I think we, have, we get good information how to behave for the future. So let's uh, think about the two questions um, that I have. The one question is um, what uto utopias came true and the second uh, question is, which dystopias came true? And uh, looking at the utopias, um, I must say I'm still more than happy that I live now, that I've gone through the last 20 years. I love technology, uh, technological progress. I love everything that is happening. Things are you know, improving. It's always you know, something new, you have to recombine things, you have to understand things, everything is moving very fast, I love that. And parts of the original ideas survived, um, the 20 years, uh, ideas like free, more or less free communication with everybody you want to communicate with, you can find people all over the world, um, more or less without restrictions that are interested in the same things as you are, <coughs> and things like this. So it's, it's very open, it's very uh, accessible. You know, the internet changed the world a lot in this, uh, in this part, but there are also dystopias that came through. Um, for example, something we are very su uh, suffering a lot recently is this whole th um, thing, the uh, fake news, um, filter bubbles, misinformation. So free access to information is not always information access to good information. Sometimes it's really bad information. And the second part is that it's, uh, we all started kind of equal when, it, uh, when the World Wide Web opened for us, but now we are not equal anymore. There are huge corporations um, that dominate the cyberspace and that are very important, I mean, for, s for several reasons, and that are very strong. And uh, to show you a little bit how big and important uh, they are. I have a little chart that was the questions. Now the chart shows, um, just you know, give you a glimpse of how powerful they are. The chart shows the uh, market shares of Facebook and Google in different countries. For example, here in, in the US it's 50%, in the UK 65%, and in Germany even 75%. And the, the cake they are uh, eating is getting bigger and bigger because more and more ads uh, go online. So that is something that came true, uh, or that not came true, that was the dystopia that at the beginning we did not really expect, but there was, if you look back, back we were very naive, so it's not really surprising that we have this now. And uh, what, is the, what are the values that drive this um, uh, development? 
the values are more, I would say, KPIs. It's about attracting attention of as many users as possible, as long as possible. And it is selling these attention, uh, selling ads to the users. That's basically what happened. And so if you look at the original idea of the free web and all that stuff, you know, there's not much left here. It's not free, it's all, you know, uh, KPI <laughs> driven more or less. So that should teach us that we have a chance to lead the stuff, the future, in, in, into the right direction, but there's also a dystopian aspect of it. So um, uh, now we are witnessing, and it's um, an even bigger revolution. Um, since we, you know, we re reflect the past, now we look into the future and we realize it's, it's a revolution that is going deeper. And it's, for me, it's always kind of difficult to explain how deep it goes and how exactly uh, uh, it will change the world. But I have a very strong feeling that it's extremely deep. I have a little chart I already um, uh, that already shows the original situation where we come from, the individual and the world. That's what we see. <clears throat> That's how uh, we've been living for millions of years. And in the time of the mass media, some devices came in, like TV or radio. Um, these devices are still part of our world, and they are devices, you switch them on, you switch them off. It's very simple, and we are used to that, and you know, we exist around these devices. We still have a strong uh, interaction with the world besides these devices. And I would say, starting in the 90s, <coughs> we got a completely different development. Now we are more and more surrounded by a layer, uh, a digital layer, that is always on, that is a big, big difference, and that is more and more driven by artificial intelligence. I think that's very important. And that's something we really have to realize that is a real game changer. And it all started with the spread of the smartphone, with the iPhone uh, in 2007. Um, since that, we have a device that is extremely personal, that is very close to us, and that um, contains more or less all aspects of our life. That's the reason why I think there's really a difference now. If you focus it, uh, if you look at it, um, uh, it's you know if you think about your um, the last two days or last week, you have to realize that even we are on the, the revolution is already is only starting. We are already uh, doing a lot of uh, decisions machine based, and that's what I mean with this digital layer. You know the interaction with the world is not neutral, it's not us and the world and a few tools that we switch on and off. We are more and more relying on uh, machines. We check the weather to find out what to wear tomorrow. We check the route to the beach if it's sunny. Uh, we check the stock market, we check prices for sneakers. We do everything, we communicate all the time with these devices. So they are not separate from us. They're getting closer and closer to us. And there, is, uh, there are a lot of devices coming, like um, voice interaction tools like uh, Alexa or um, Google HomePod or something like that, VR, AR, and more things to come, watches. So the digital layer that surrounds us is, is tightening up and is uh, getting more and more between us and the world. So if we think, we, if we agree on that, we must say, you know, we really have to think about what is driving these machines, what is happening inside of the machines, what is happening in these algorithmic systems, what is happening in these artificial intelligence services that make decisions. And artificial intelligence mm, is, uh, is uh, different than it used to be so far. Up to now, there were algorithmic systems that uh, reacted on us. I, um, uh, artificial intelligence is more, you know, it's self-learning systems, and they predict the future, and on this prediction, they make decisions. That's 
So we have now in our digital layer um, decision-making self-learning systems. So if you think about that, we have to really decide what values they're based on. As I described in the first phase of the revolution, we have values that maybe we do not fully agree on, like um, you know, attract as much attention and sell the, the uh, user data and the attention of the user. So my suggestion is we need AI based on humanistic values. If we agree on that, we have to look at three questions. Question number one, uh, what are humanistic values? Question number two, what happens when AI does not include them? Question number three, how can we include them? We go through this. So the debate about what are humanistic values can be big and long, but let, let's make it short. I found a very good concept from uh, Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, uh, th um, two authors, who wrote that um, or developed this idea that societies, the goal of humanistic societies is to improve, increase the capabilities of the people, not of a few person, individuals, but all of them. So if education is good for increasing capabilities, um, you invest in um, uh, education. And the same, you can uh, transfer it to the to technology, because technology is there to improve the ca capabilities of human beings. So we could say that um, if we want technology that is based on, on humanistic values, we need technology that improves the capabilities of people. Okay, if we agree on that, we go to the next uh, question. What, ha what happens when AI does not include them? That's the second question, very important. We can see it, we don't have to speculate it. We can look at what is happening at the moment. We see that a lot of companies and countries are investing in AI. I'll give you a short idea of the amounts that are invested and who invests how much. And you can see the main drivers are the US and China. And if you look at um, their values or their systems that they are establishing, you see that on one side, China is trying to use AI to get more control over people, so the state knows it all, and the US are trying to uh, use AI to get control over profit, so the market knows it all. So I must say, I neither want to live in a you know, state-controlled um, system, nor do I want to be in a, in a um, market-controlled uh, system. So that's why I say we need um, oh, sorry, uh, we need, um, we need uh, humanistic values in this. Uh, in this. Um, to emphasize how important it is, I can show you what um, Facebook did lately. They, did, they checked what natural engagement patterns exist uh, in connection to the content. So on the right side, you see prohibited content, on the left side, allowed content, and the engagement of people is in the allowed content section is average. And the closer it gets to prohibited content, the, clo the, the more engagement uh, uh, develops. So that's a real problem. So they are looking for our instincts and how to get them and how to use them to, um, to um, give us a feeling of you know, intense experience and stuff like this. So we should be very careful with all that. And we should focus on the next uh, question, the most important question, how can we include them? How can we include humanistic values into artificial intelligence? Um, we have, I think the most important thing that we have to realize is that we are the generation who will decide where we are going, who will make the f this future, the utopian future or the dystopian future um, exist. We decide it now and um, we have strong allies. I would emphasize that we have to uh, get uh, the, the transparency and the design of AI um, regulated. And there's a strong ally like the European Union, which is really strong if you look at, for example, 
what the big tech companies spend on lobbying in Brussels, you see that big tech companies nearly spend three times more than the uh, top seven car manufacturers. So they agree on how um, powerful the EU is. Uh, if, you, if we agree on this, we should, um, that's not everything. So we should, when you, when you vote, look for um, parties that uh, think that AI is important that um, work for this humanistic value idea. There's a, um, a German author, um, Ferdinand von Schirach, who is uh, trying to get the EU um, um, uh, to recognize um, some aspects that are, seem important, that people don't get manipulated, that people don't get spied on, and things like this. But on an individual level, you can do a lot, you know, because it's a fantastic time and a fantastic world to change the future and to work together. And uh, I think uh, if, you, if you have money, invest in companies that are focused on uh, um, humanistic AI, AI based on humanistic values. If you look for a job, if you're young, invest your time and your brain into this. Um, if you work in politics, of course you should focus on the um, humanistic values, values. And it's not just something that the techies should do. It's important for the whole society. It's important for all of us. Because it's, as I told you, it's part of this digital layer that will define our relationship and our in interaction with the world. So it's really time to wake up and to stand up and to work for a better future with technology that supports us and makes uh, our capabilities as individuals and as humans bigger. So please wake up and stand up. And I say that as a human being, a European citizen, as a professional um, from, from the you know, communications, and uh, as a father. I hope you agree and I hope you join in the quest for the better future. Thank you very much.